Um, well, my name is uh, Rebecca Sabach, or Becky. Um, and me and Yuval uh, finished high school a week ago, and now we're here in Bremen. Um, right now, I am, I'm moving to Germany. So after this uh, delegation, I'm going to go study medicine in Germany. And um, I hope to stay here and live here. Um, yes, Yuval? Yeah. Um, so I'm Yuval. Like Becky said, I'm a grade 12 student. And uh, throughout high school, I majored in computer science and physics. And um, really, oh, now I'm going off in a few months off to the army. And really, it's been a great experience being here in Bremen overall and speaking with a lot of people about um, our experiences as Israeli teenagers and hearing their views and what they know about Israel. So it's really been um, an eye-opening experience. And uh, we both studied at the Leo Beck High School where um, they put a lot of value on shared existence and uh, trying to um, encourage children or students to volunteer and part of that is a connection with other countries so me and Yuval were part of many delegations throughout our high school um, years um, in 10th grade we were part of an Australia delegation so it was COVID, uh, so we only did it over Zoom. But throughout the years, we, we did get to fly to other countries. And uh, well, we're here in Bremen to tell uh, students from German schools about Israel and inform them about Israeli politics. And um, we'll also explain to them the basic um, concept of what's it like being a teenager in Israel, like you've all said. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you touched it here and there that you're studying at Leo Beck. What makes this uh, school, this high school, unique? And how come that they sent you to Bremen? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So uh, Leo Beck is actually a Jewish reform high school in Israel, which is the Jewish reform people aren't, there aren't a, uh, a large population of the, in Israel. And Leo Beck specifically is the only high school in Israel that actually has a Jewish reform community in it. And because of that, we have connection with many different reform communities around the world because it is, the, I think, the largest sector of Judaism in the United States, for example. Um, and that way we form connections with communities in Boston and Los Angeles and everywhere around the world. And you get that at no other high school in Israel, that same amount of connection with people from around the world and uh, in turn coming here to Bremen from it. Yes. Now, Haifa is known for its diversity in terms of religion and ethnicity. Um, to which extent is that reflected in, you know, in, in Leo Beck school and then who, who was allowed to, to join? And can you tell us about that a bit? Um, well, I can say as um, my, from my personal experience, um, I am half Arab. My dad is a Christian Arab who lives in Israel and my mom is a Christian German that came from Wuppertal. <laughs> yeah. And um, I only went to Leobeck High School. So in ninth grade, I went to an interview and they checked my grades and they interviewed me like every other student. And um, well, Leobeck encourages other students to come. They encourage Arab students, they encourage Jewish students, uh, maybe even Baha'i students. Um, so Leobeck is very open to um, every student. They don't discriminate anybody. They're very open to, equ they value equality a lot. Um, yes, and one of the things that uh, Leo Beck likes to brag about is that also many um, female students go to scientific majors, so um, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important to add that while there are Arab students at Leo Beck, it's still a Jewish school and like many other Jewish schools in Israel, most of the students are Jewish because there's a different education system for the Arab uh, kids and the Jewish kids in different languages. So while Becky is uh, successful in learning in Hebrew, I'm not sure if that's true for uh, everyone learning in their second language. I mean, it's uh, uh, both a uh, private and a public school, right? Yes. So then how is this diversity reflected in the curricula, for example? Do you, is it uh, mandatory to learn Arabic, for example? How, how, how is that reflected in is it in the political subjects, in, in the languages, or history, or whatever? What do you think about that? So I would say overall that it's not something unique to Leobek what our relationship with uh, like Arabic for example in Israel and between grades 5 and 10 we have to learn Arabic as a mandatory subject in school 
no matter what school you learn in. And overall, in our civics classes, we do have very heated political discussions. But because, again, still a, min a very small minority of students are Arab, then it's not really reflected in every day-to-day -day life, for, for example, for me. Maybe in Becky's class it's different because... Um, well, I know about in Israel, um, you have to have in middle school Arabic studies, it's, it's mandatory. In some schools they also offer French, um, so students can choose either to learn French or Arabic. Um, in high school you can choose other majors because Arabic uh, will become a major subject. So um, the, the level of Arabic that Jewish students learn is very low and in Arabic schools, um, Hebrew is mandatory because it's a Jewish state, so it's quite different in every school. And we can delve into that later if there's an interest, but you, you've already mentioned these uh, heated debates in your politics class, so what are the important questions you discuss there, just to get an idea, um, what are the concerns and topics you discuss about these days, which might also couple years ago. Yeah, so I would say mainly is these days it's really the judicial reforms happening in Israel and we have a, ve a very vocal minority in the class that does support them and then there's very heated discussions between them and those who are against the reforms. Um, so I would say that's the, been the major topic in the past year and overall since I can remember Israel has been in elections since I started talking about civics so that's been a major thing for us throughout all these years and the extremism and radicalism in Israel. So, I mean, just that if yeah. everybody can, can follow, could you please maybe quickly wrap up what this uh, judicial reform is about, that we're all on the same page? Uh, sure. So basically, right now there's a very right-wing government in Israel, and they, want, they think that the balance of powers between the, leg um, the legislative branches in Israel is too, it's, it's not fair, and they think that the Supreme Court in Israel has too much power over the Israeli parliament. And they claim that what they want to do is overall balance between them because the Supreme Court is too, uh, too much left-leaning while the parliament reflects the people and is right-leaning. So basically what they're proposing is to pass a reform that would hurt the, the Supreme Court of Israel and really impact their power and, give, and they can uh, and let the government appoint the new judges um, of the Supreme Court, effectively making them useless and making the parliament the only, uh, the only branch of government in Israel. And that would mean that there's no checks and balances to uh, Israeli political system. Only, like for example, what you have in the United States, where you have the, where the Supreme Court is also appointed by the government, but you have a Declaration of Independence that, um, and a Constitution that tells you what you can and what you can't do. And in Israel, we don't have that. So effectively, this reform means the government gets all the power. And many Israelis are fearing uh, that Israel is going to slide into some form of dictatorship in the next few years if it does pass through. You mentioned the Declaration of Independence. I mean, that's that's a important document, right? Also for the protest movement. Can you tell us a bit about that and which that values this, this document reflects? Just to get an idea uh, what it means that for Jewish and democratic state, which kind of tries to balance out both uh, aspects. Yeah. So effectively, the Declaration of Independence in Israel really talks about Israel being both a Jewish and a democratic state, and it states that uh, there are certain things that. Uh, the country must hold up without discrimination towards any race, religion, or sex. But the problem is that unlike the United States where the Constitution is legally binding, the Declaration of Independence in Israel doesn't actually have a real effect on politics and it can't be used as a... More of a suggestion. It's a suggestion yes. and a main thing also that the Supreme Court in Israel, until now they could base off their decisions based off the Declaration of Independence. And that was really a problem for the right-wing parts of Israel because they feel that the Declaration of Independence can be interpreted in multiple ways because it's not actually a constitution. And a lot of these reforms are actually saying that we can't use that as a basis for what we're doing from now on and that's why the protests are using the Declaration of Independence as a major factor uh, that Israel was founded on, so it should continue on that. Yeah. So uh, a query um, directed to both of you. Um, we, in the last month, we just learned through the like, German media that there's some protests going on. Um, so where's the protest movement now, in your point of view? And um, what is the government doing now? Because as far as I know, they announced to move on again with the judicial reform, just that we can better understand what's going on in Israel these days. 
Um, well, can, I can talk about the protests. Um, personally, in Haifa, we see every week uh, a protest on Shabbat. Uh, so Shabbat evening, uh, a lot of um, Haifa citizens go to the streets and protest, and they have signs and they have flags, and uh, they go to the like the central of the city. Um, this is, I think, the 26th week that they've been protesting all over Israel, not, in ha not only in Haifa, uh, but they've been getting bigger and bigger and uh, more people are joining and, uh, well, Israel is a democratic state, so that's why they're trying to change things in a democratic way. And um, protesting is right now the, the most powerful form that they can, uh, that they have or the ma most powerful tool that they have, so um, that's what they're trying to do and that's how they're trying to change things. I mean, in 2011, I think, there were these major protests on Rothschild Boulevard, and of course there was this like historic peace movement. Um, is, are the current protests unique, or do you see any similarities to previous protests to kind of uh, address similar but also not the same topics? So I would say that the, these protests are very unique in the matter, first of all, the amount of people that go out to them. There's been hundreds of thousands and everyone knows people that go to the protests. And like a lot of people in my personal life, these are the first protests that they actually went to in their life. Is the same with you? Um, yes, also for me. Um, and uh, uh, unlike 2011, where the protests were about the cost of living crisis, this crisis, well, it's, it's much more existential for Israel and it doesn't only talk about the hardships of life but actually the future of the country. And I think that's a major factor for many people. And that's why we see also so much uh, like general strikes coming out and uh, army reservists refusing to serve in the military. And that's something we've never seen before in Israel. Okay, so now we'll open the floor to your questions, comments and queries. So if there's anything, please just raise your hand and you can get the mic and... Okay. <laughs> okay. You understand me? Yes. Okay. My name is Tanya and I would like to know um, have you been before um, in Germany or is it the first time for you? Talking about Wuppertal? Yes. <laughs> um, well, my mom comes from Wuppertal. Yeah. Um, she moved to Israel because of my dad okay. and um, it's a long story, <laughs> yeah, it's a very romantic story, um, uh, yeah, so every year um, we come to Germany to visit all of my mom's side of the family, uh, we usually go to Wuppertal and then we travel all over uh, Germany, uh, we try to incorporate other um, uh, bordering countries uh, yeah, but it's mostly about the family and visiting the cousins and um, visiting the uncles and aunts and yeah. So I, I've been in Germany many times. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. But never in Bremen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But maybe what is your, your impression about being yeah. in Germany? Yeah. You can um, elaborate on that a bit. Also. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who has never been Sorry. to Germany before, right? I've actually been to Germany in uh, 2016, but it, okay. was, but it was more of a going here on vacation. So I didn't actually get to experience meeting the German people. And actually my first impression of Germany is very positive. First of all, from the interactions we had with the students here in Germany, they seem, well, a majority of them do seem well informed and I'm not sure if it's because we met those specific people or it's all Maybe students in Germany. Picked, I don't know. Yeah, um, but really they seem to also be very interested in what we were talking about and they're also very respectful, which is something that uh, it, we're not always used to in Israel, and we're used to students being a little more, uh, having more chutzpah. And um, so yeah, it's been a very positive peop, uh, experience, and also everyone we met was incredibly friendly and incredibly interested in talking with us. So it's been great. But apart from, from the school visits, mm -hmm. what are your impressions of being in Bremen in terms of, you know, the city itself, its architecture, its history, how people behave on the streets, how they drive on the streets? So what do you think about being here? Um, so I would say, uh, first of all, Bremen is incredibly beautiful, oh, and I agree. yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I would add that um, first of all, just it really like the first time I, we went down the street, it was it was really a weird experience because I know Bremen has five hundred thousand people, but like the streets here seem very small and very uh, like it's still a small village or a small town. Um, <laughs> just, yeah. Um, so that was also something that was pretty beautiful for me. 
And other than that, I mean, we've experienced some things that we're not that used to in Israel. Like, there's a lot of homeless people, which we don't experience in Israel. And, um, and we saw a few drug users today, which is something we don't see in Haifa. But maybe in the bigger cities in Israel, we do see that. I, mean, I just, yeah. I'm not there enough. Yeah. Um, My bike got stolen. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, but overall, Bremen is beautiful and we've had, uh, we don't feel a danger in the streets, even though mm -hmm. we see those things. Yes. And uh, is there something you think that could inspire you when you go back to Israel? Or when you go to Wuppertal, I mean, you can also bring something <laughs> to do. Um, I would say that I really enjoyed the biking here, that we bike from place to place. So that's something that I really want to get into, maybe where I live in, uh, in my, I live in a village, not in Haifa, so it's a, uh, I have a place to ride bikes there, so you know it's a great mode of transportation and it's also really enjoyable. So I would say that's the main thing from Bremen. So, so the shaft, could you maybe explain the concept and also relate it to other like organizing, uh, organized villages? Kibbutz is maybe something you've heard before from the history books or so. Could you hear it on that? Bit? Yeah, so a kibbutz is basically a village where it's a communal village where a lot around uh, a few hundred people live together and basically they share all their money together in the same pool. And it's, it was very popular when Israel was founded, but in recent years, Israel has become more and more uh, capitalist and less socialist, and it's very tough for those kibbutzes, kibbutzim to uh, stay afloat. Amoshav is basically like kibbutz, but we don't share the money with each other. So it's a village, but each person has their own money, but there's still a very communal uh, uh, feeling. So we celebrate holidays together in the Spain place, but we don't, um, and it's like, it's very in the nature. Mm -hmm. And I was very astonished. We were um, in Israel um, in March with Yama yeah. and Brina. <laughs> and only 10%, um, only 10% of socialism mm -hmm. now, right now. And the other one, 90% of capitalism. And I was very astonished about that. But um, so many people, so many young people would like to go in a kibbutz. Um, Um, which is the mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say mainly because there's a style of living in a kibbutz that uh, families especially find very enjoyable because you know the, the kids can roam the streets freely and there's not many cars and there's uh, fresh air and you don't have the pollution in the city and other than that the cost of living in Israel is very high especially in the cities so going to live in the kibbutz is a cheaper option Yes. yes, and you get a house instead of an apartment yeah. with a garden and yeah, yeah so wide streets for the kids to play and big, um, bigger playgrounds. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's like uh, living in a village or living in a city. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like you didn't uh, tell us so much about your impressions of Bremen. Oh, yeah. yeah um, Rather than that, maybe juxtapose it with uh, the life experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, for me personally, I always get inspired when I'm in Germany. Um, I, I find Germany very uh, home-like. Um, as much as I love Israel, I find Germany just more comfortable for me. Um, <laughs> you can also censor that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I like. I'm a very organized person, so uh, Germany is very organized and clean. And uh, <clears throat> well, they they also value. Um, Uh, recycling and, and they uh, talk a lot about climate change with, which is a less talked about topic in Israel I mean it's um, it's understandable because Israel has bigger problems um, but I, I do feel that uh, it's a more relaxed country less tension um, maybe Israelis could learn to honk less on the street <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned that uh, Israelis are not so well organized But I mean, don't the uh, current process, uh, protests make clear that at least the civil society is pretty well organized. Yeah. And that's also <laughs> quite unique for the region, right? Because yeah. when you look at the Arab Spring or other developments happening, it's not the same as we as we can witness with Israel, right? Um, I would say mainly that's just because Israel is a first world country and uh, the Arab Spring was in third world countries. So also, even though the current government is trying to move on with reforms that would hurt the democracy in Israel. Currently, Israel has very strict laws on what you can do and what you can't do, and there are multiple levels that stop these things from going, uh, um, from going down the hill. So I would say in that way, we are uh, 
we are, but you can still see them protest that they aren't very organized inside the protest <laughs> themselves. A lot of people come to them, so that's okay. impressive. But yeah. But in um, volunteering and being part of the civil society is also a big part of your studies at Leo Beck. What are you doing in your free time when you volunteer? Okay. Well, in Israel, um, we have a certain amount of volunteering work we have to do um, during high school. So uh, in Israel, every student that wants to graduate high school has to do 30 hours e each year of high school. So in 10th grade, 30, in uh, 11th grade, and in 12th grade, each year, 30 hours. Uh, because Leobek is a, a special school, uh, they, and they value uh, volunteering and uh, charity work, they ask of the students to do double. So each student has to do 60 hours each year. Um, and me and Yuval do a lot of delegations, and um, we do a lot of work at school. So we had the memorial service for um, the soldiers that uh, fell in all of the um, uh, wars that Israel was in. And um, I played the violin there. And um, throughout the year, I also play in an orchestra where we go to elderly homes or we go to um, uh, Holocaust survivors and we do like little concerts uh, to cheer them up and yeah, that sort of thing. And do you both? Yeah, so I also similar to Becky, uh, we, I do have a, I'm very in, into the program of international relations with Israel so we try to, community service in Lubeck has many different forms and uh, ways so it's not just helping the elderly or things like that. Mm. Um, so it's really connecting between Leobek and other Jewish communities around the world, especially in these times. And, and other than that, I lead the Model UN Club in our school. And uh, yeah, and, um, and I also was in a youth movement called the, uh, of the National um, Organization for Saving the Nature. So in a youth movement that like we hike a lot and you know, um, we help little kids like learn how to build a fire and things like that. So that's also a big part of my life. It's good to know. Fire. Yeah. So what are your plans for the upcoming future? I mean, you already mentioned your medicine studies, but well, what are you doing? Yeah, so I'm going to go uh, after in uh, around two months in September to the uh, IDF in the Israeli army. And over there I'm going to do nine years in a, a special program in the intelligence units. So what I'm going to do is three years degree in, uh, in Middle Eastern studies and in computer science. And after that I become an officer in the Israeli intelligence and it could be uh, serving in the gathering of intelligence or in the research of intelligence and many different factors that relate maybe to technology or maybe to Middle East and we'll see what happens in the next few years and throughout my training. So pers the, reg the regular Israelis have to go for a minimum of three years the for men, yeah. for the mandatory, yeah. and uh, for a woman it's two years. Yeah. But personally, I'm going for nine years in the army, so it's a, a very long commitment. Yeah. But I get a degree, the, so uh, the minimum is two years for women yeah. and three years for men, okay. and the maximum is nine years. So yeah. Yuvada is doing yeah. the maximum. Why, why nine years? So I, I'm really personally, I'm really interested both in uh, like both in the scientific topics and uh, computer science, and also in uh, you know, Middle Eastern studies and uh, geopolitics and things like that. So really that program was really, it combined both worlds for me, so that's why I was really interested in going to it. And the Army tries to um, help uh, students that finish high school, that are going into the Army, they try to help them to incorporate something that they are passionate about with the Army. So uh, there's an option to study throughout your service in the Army. So the Army pays your, for your studies and then the, the time you study, you also have to give back to the army. So if you study three years, you go after your studies three years to the army. Yeah. And it's important to add that the, because everyone in Israel, almost everyone goes through the army, it's really the structure of Israeli society. So if you don't, so the army has not only a responsibility to protect the state of Israel, but also a responsibility to uh, help strengthen the economy of Israel and provide people with abilities that they can use also in the real world, if it's the high-tech sector that's a large part of Israel's economy or um, or It also other shapes sections. the mindset of people. Yeah. yeah. And is it with a guarantee that you will have a job there afterwards? In my program specifically? Yes. 
So in my program, I get I do uh, three years of training, and then I go into different positions in the army for two years. After every two years, they change, and afterwards, it really depends on what I do inside the army. But most of the people in my program go later on to be in the Ministry of Defense or uh, the Mossad or different other agencies in Israel that are related related to. Uh, yeah, no, you can you can do whatever you want. There's a, there's even some people that after those nine years began studying medicine. Yeah, which is a, a very yeah, yes. yes. Um, so really, there's a, a large sector of things to do. So most people go or into security issues in the state of Israel, or they go to the high tech sector where they can uh, earn a lot of money, and that's uh, also something that yes. they like. So it's also important to add that um, Israel values people that go to the army. They value the service you do, and um, they they emphasize that um, it's very important for your job later to also show that you did a a meaningful service to the country, even if it wasn't the army, because there are also other option you, uh, options. You can do um, national service. And uh, meaning uh, you go to a hospital and you work there or you go to um, an orphanage and you work there. Um, there are many options. But um, in Israel, you do have to show some kind of uh, commitment to the country or some kind of um, service to your country. Did you talk about this commitment to your own country with the German students and kids? Yes. And what was the response? <laughs> yeah, so actually we had, a, um, we had a discussion about it yesterday with the, some of the students where they asked us about, um, like, it, do we have to serve in the army? And they asked us, do you want to serve in the army? And for me, and like personally, and my, maybe it's my own bubble, but like it's something that's obvious for me that everyone goes <laughs> to the army and you have to do a meaningful full service. And I think in Germany, because maybe you don't face a regular security risk on your daily basis, then German students don't feel the need to, I know, be very patriotic or very uh, want to help the military or very uh, um, very into that matter. But again, it's different in uh, a lot of parts of Israel. There are, more there are places that are more patriotic and more want to serve in the army, and there are places that are less. But I think you yourself want to have gone to the army because you yes. escaped to Germany. <laughs> uh, could you shed light a bit on... Uh, Arabs in the army, how, how is the procedure? Is it also yeah. mandatory or is it quite rigidly filtered? Or mm, well, how's, how's I can say that um, Arabs in Israel don't have um, the, they, it, oh sorry, <laughs> the army isn't mandatory for them. So for me, I don't have, uh, it's, it's not mandatory for me. Um, so I could respectfully decline. Um, they do. Uh, ask for an interview and ask why I won't go to the army or why I don't want to go to the army. Um, a lot of people or a lot of Arabs decline because they do have families in other countries, neighboring countries. For example, uh, I know somebody who has family in Syria, so it's not fair to ask of them to go and, um, I don't know. Fight their brothers. Fight, yeah, exactly. Um, for me, I told the army that um, I would like to go to Germany and learn there. And uh, the, the biggest problem for them was uh, why did I go to a Jewish school? Um, I don't think they understand, understood completely because they called me a few times. Um, yeah, but there are... Uh, well, I, t I told them that in primary school, it was an Arab Christian school which is private, it belongs to a church. And then, um, because I play the violin, I decided that I wanted to do more with music and uh, do something that um, will make music more in interesting for me. And um, there was a very popular school, uh, a Jewish school, that was a, an art school. So you learn uh, in the morning, normal subjects, math, uh, English, Hebrew, and uh, yeah, science. And then in the afternoon, you start um, duets or choir or orchestra. And uh, it incorporates all of the kids in your class. So there are four classes. One class is um, dancing, theater, uh, sculpture, and art. And then my class was music. So after that school, I was so used to, sorry, I was so used to learning in Hebrew 
that my level in Arabic went down and I couldn't go back to the Arabic school. So I decided to go to Leovic. <laughs> yeah, but also Leovic was very, very impressive. So of spy, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't sad that I couldn't go to the Arabic school. Um, I was actually very glad to go to Leovic. I had a wonderful experience. Um, and I will go back to your question. Um, sure. <laughs> there are many Arabs that do go to the army as volunteer work, um, or they volunteer their time in service to the army. Um, but they do have to commit to the minimum of years. Uh, a lot of Druze go to the army. It's very popular in the Druze um, community. Um, the only problem is that a lot of uh, uh, sections in the army are closed off to Arabs because they're afraid of spies. And one, also one of the reasons I didn't want to go to the army or decided not to go, I was debating for a while, um, was one section that interests me a lot like the intelligence they don't accept Arabs so I decided that um, I could do something more meaningful for me or maybe even the country um, in a different place yeah any other questions from your side do you want to stay in Germany did I get it right or? yes I would like to stay in Germany <laughs> Why? Um, I, I feel more at home in Germany yeah I'm a, uh, I think I'm a very um, like relaxed person and in Israel nobody's very relaxed, they're very tense and uh, the yeah. Are, in Israel are much more on time and organized. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes. you have to stay in Bogotá all your life. Yeah, well, <laughs> in Germany there are many places. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Maybe just speak out loud. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no speaker. Yeah. Okay. But first, first of all, thank you for your very interesting insight. Um, and you said at the beginning that the meeting with the German people to the Bremen was very eye-opening. Can you elaborate a little bit what you learned know that, like, um, and what did you expect before? And second to that, maybe, um, maybe you can describe what, what was different, like, staying in all those pupils to the visits you had before and not in this class? Okay. So do you want me to start with the first question? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say, first of all, I was surprised by how much they know actually about the conflict. And while it may not be the same position as I have on the conflict, what, meaning I'm more pro-Israel and sometimes here the more pro-Palestinian. Um, so I was, like, I was positively surprised that they do know a lot of the things that they're talking about and they asked relevant questions that I'm not sure that many Israelis would know to say about other countries around the world in the same manner. Um, so that was surprising and other than that I'm not sure if like I kind of expected it beforehand but seeing their opinions that are um, not the same opinions as you see in Israel and they're more uh, they have difficult questions about like for again for example what's happening in the West Bank and what's happening in Gaza and those are questions that in Israel we kind of we like we all have the obvious answers to them that our security is above everything but it's something difficult more to explain to them for example, when you see on one side that many more lives are being lost than another, then it's sometimes it's hard to justify one side over another. And having these conversations was something that you know also provoked some of my thoughts. Yes. Um, uh, about the students, if I understood correctly, um, the comparison between students here and students in Nordrhein Westfalen. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. No? If you want to tell us something about it. Now, how your visits differ like, from the experience? Ah, you okay. Had. I mean, you were traveling with a family, but yeah. maybe the experience was different without them. Okay. Um, well, here the, the conversation was more um, like uh, directed to Israel, and uh, we had, I think, more meaningful conversations. Uh, when I go to visit with my family, it's more like casual talk, like uh, when I talk with my cousins or with uh, kids from their class, it's more like, yeah, okay, where do you want to go eat ice cream? It's less about um, 
why do soldiers kill Palestinians? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but actually, I, I go with my cousins every year to a, um, a summer camp in Steinberg and there everybody's very interested. They say, oh, you're from Israel? Wow. Uh, so what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So I do see that a lot of uh, students from Germany are very interested, even if it isn't um, directed or if it isn't uh, like a meeting that's scheduled. Um, they do ask and they do, I see that they uh, do know basic information um, and it's always very, <laughs> very funny to, to like introduce myself in German and then be like, okay, I'm from Israel. Um. <laughs> but but um, what do you hear about, what do you read about Germany and Israel um, and is it similar to what you have seen so far here? Um, so, <laughs> I'm not sure how much it's we... It's more or less directed at you. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Vicky. It's okay. So, I would say, I mean, Germany, well, it's a beautiful country. You don't have many uh, very strong issues happening here that I would say that are compared to, like, for example, what you hear about Israel in Germany. Um, so, I would say mainly what we've been hearing in recent years, is, uh, in the past year, is, like, Germany's position in the conflict in Ukraine. So, that's been something that uh, your country has been a major part of. Um, from that matter, and other, and other than that, many Israelis move to Germany because the cost of living here is much cheaper than in Israel and the quality of life here is very high. Um, so, like, we hear about that and sometimes we get a little jealous of you guys. But, um, but yeah, I would say that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, have, I have read an article about um, a young man who uh, went from Israel to Berlin. In Germany, and um, I was very impressed about his sentence to say, "I came as an Israel people, and I went back, I went back to Israel as a Jewish people." And mm. this was very interesting about yeah. him to say this. Um, what do you think about that? Yes. Um, well, I can actually. We talked about this in civics class that in Israel it's very comfortable to be a, a Jew. Yeah. You don't think about it. Uh, there are laws, Jewish laws, keeping kosher, um, no transportation, public transportation on Shabbat. Um, uh, on holidays it gets celebrated all over the country. Um, so it's very easy to be, to be, uh, to say you're Jewish. It's like in your daily life. Uh, everybody talks Hebrew around you and um, the thing that he said uh, where he came back as a Jew from Germany is that in Germany you actually have to think about every decision you make as a Jew because you go to a restaurant uh, they're gonna serve you pork you go to um, well on Shabbat you go out there is public transpo transportation so it's a very different atmosphere and very different lifestyle for uh, Jewish people to live either in Israel or abroad um, so when he says he came back as a Jew, uh, I think he means he was more connected and more um, uh, aware of the fact that he wants to uh, keep his heritage and uh, he values his religion. So yes, it's, it's easier to be a Jew in Israel, a casual, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Asking the Jewish person about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so really, I do agree with a lot of things that Becky said, and also me personally, I've lived abroad for a few years throughout my life, and um, in the United States and in a little more places. And really, in Israel, you feel it on you. You feel the Jewishness on a daily basis, and that's something that you kind of take for granted. But then, when you go abroad, then I'm, I'm not sure I agree completely with the saying. Because personally, when I go abroad, I, I feel way more Israeli than I do feel Jewish because I don't have those Jewish laws in my life. But for example, the moment I meet an Israeli in the, in, for example, in the United States, then uh, like, I have straight conversation with them and they, I still feel much more at home. And, um, and really, maybe I would feel even less Jewish in, or it's more difficult to get to the Jewishness part of me because there are certain things that you just don't feel. For example, on Yom Kippur in Israel, people fast and you don't drive cars and you feel it every day on the street and like a few years back I was here on vacation in uh, France on Yom Kippur and you just don't feel it 
anywhere and you don't feel it and you know you go to the supermarket and you, you know you, like or you go by a shop and you see it's open and you can't live that exact same lifestyle and it's much more difficult especially as a secular person to still hope and yeah, still still keep these holidays and that's also a major factor of why I want to continue living in Israel so I'll still be connected to my Jewishness without having to work too hard for it. How long, for how long time have you been there in the United States? So I lived in the United States for three, uh, for yeah. three and a half years overall, so separated across okay. a few different time periods. Okay. <laughs> what do you learn about Germany in Israel? What do you read in the newspaper? It's only about anti-Semitism. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say we hear that much about anti-Semitism specifically in Germany. We hear it like all across Europe. But overall, Germany, um, specifically in recent years, there's been uh, great controversies with Poland in the regard to how the Holocaust is viewed there and the role of the Polish people in the Holocaust. So really, I think that strengthens the ties between Israel and Germany, where Germany is very adamant about their part in the Holocaust. And, you know, we do feel the, like, the, the great support from Germany and Israel and the un, uh, unwavering support compared to other places where we have seen it like uh, deteriorate in the past few years. Um, so really Israelis are really, really enjoy Germany and uh, you know, and they really yeah. believe in the connection between the countries. And other than that, we you know, we hear about the regular European things about the cost of living and free university and all those things that are, that we don't necessarily have in Israel, but you have that are yeah. that we would want to have one day here. Uh, one thing that I would like to add is that I think the older generation in Israel is more aware of uh, is, uh, Germany's support. Um, uh, well, they, they heard about the, the money that Germany gives Israel every year and uh, I think maybe um, more uh, the older generation me reads more newsletters, so uh, they also <laughs> read more about Germany. Um, yes, I also wanted to add something about the younger generation, but I forgot. <laughs> Come to mind. Yeah, I will remember. Should it come into your mind now? Yeah, no. <laughs> How many languages do I speak? Uh, so I, I only speak two languages, which is it's, it's a lot, but compared to Becky. Yeah, yeah I speak uh, four languages. So with my father and with my two brothers, uh, we speak Arabic at home and with my mother, German. Um, and then Hebrew because of Israel and uh, English because my parents talked uh, in English together. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you think that the protests against the so-called justice reform uh, will win? Only Netanyahu and his campaign. What, what would you say at the moment? It will be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> you will watch it in, yes. in a year. Give us a good statement. Um, so I would say that, first of all, it's very hard to tell what's going to happen, and it really depends on what happens in the next few weeks with the, the legislation moving forward or so. At the end of the day, I, don't, I, I think Netanyahu will fold and he won't go out with the with the legislation because he saw what happened last time and back in March where there was a general strike in Israel and now the protests they, they are getting they're, they're getting a little smaller by the week because so much time has passed since then and it's been uh, 25 weeks and now the moment that the legislation will come back then the protests will grow again and uh, it'll be a very major factor and um, other than that I do believe that there are still some people that have the best will of Israel in heart and the Israeli government and they'll see that the so many people that are uh, very hurt by the reforms going forward. And I think they'll see that the moment that if they start leaving Israel, so a lot of Israelis are, uh, they can get European passports because of the, their heritage. So if the moment a lot of the higher earning Israelis leave Israel, then Israel will basically collapse under the economic reasons. For example, again, because of the Orthodox Jews that don't work in Israel and they only study in the yeshivas. Yeah. Um, so basically I think the moment everything starts to deteriorate that's when the legislation will stop but I just hope that the protests will go, uh, I think they need to go very extreme to stop that before it's too late and the re legislation goes forward. Um, but really it's hard to tell yeah. so. It will probably get worse before it gets better. Yeah. So recently we had a lecture with uh, Fania Ossalzberger, who is also part of the peace movement, and she told us that she's uh, very much into drafting 
proposals for constitution. And of course, she um, told us that with the energy of somebody who wants to have this passing through. But do you think that it's realistic to have a constitution? Because it's quite interesting in itself that Israel has no constitution yet. And I think it was also part of the partition plan to include that you have to um, construct a constitution. But is this the momentum where Israel could get it? What do you guys think about it? Um, so I would, I would say that, first of all, when Israel was founded, they decided that there would be a committee in the next few years creating a constitution, but then it just fell through and we're 75 years later without a constitution. Um, so other than that, I think this is one of the worst times to make a constitution yeah. for Israel because It's such people, an unstable uh, It's such an government. unstable time and people yeah. have such different opinions and to create a constitution you can't just do it with a regular majority because mm -hmm. basically doing that would be the exact same as doing what the government right now is doing and you have you would have to have a wide consensus for that mm -hmm. and I think there's maybe one or two topics maybe in Israel that actually have a consensus on them Well we have Which a are? okay so um yeah, there's, there's also like kinds of laws in Israel that are already kind of a base for a constitution, yeah. but yeah. it's not formal. Um, the main things that people would agree on, I think probably security is still the number one issue that many Israelis agree about. And like the army is still something that all Israelis believe that is, um, you know, you should service your country. And um, other than that, like even the most basic things, like, for example, I don't even what you would describe as human rights. There are still different opinions on in Israel and who should receive them and who should not. And that's basically what a constitution is for. And you can't find agreement on that in Israel in this time. And I don't see it happening in the near future. Yeah. Also, I think Israel's, uh, they have so many problems that could be solved with a constitution that uh, right now it's like, it's so late <laughs> and it's so unstable that uh, it would have been a great solution for many, many problems in the past that, uh, like problems that we could have avoided nowadays. Um, so I do think it's a very pressing matter and one of the most important things that uh, uh, the government has to address, but maybe not this government. <laughs> Given that stark polarization, what does uh, the Israeli nation hold together, by the way? Well, um, that they belong in Israel. Okay. That's a it's great. Very, yeah. answer, <laughs> that's a great question, and also I feel like many Israelis are really feeling that today. And while I've always felt connected to all Israelis, and especially when I met them around the world, sometimes you just wonder what the other person is thinking, and you have such a different opinion on them. But I think at the end of the day, our history is what uh, binds us together, and even no matter how bad it gets in Israel. We've seen what the past has done for the Jewish people and we can't afford to just go out and spread around the world and we still need a nation for ourselves. Um, and even if the matters go to um, what they're currently headed to, I think the Israeli people will still, they still have a major drive in staying in Israel and that's why these protests are so strong and people aren't just leaving the country but they're actually fighting for their nation. So I think that's the main thing. Okay, final question. Okay, and, um, so a question and compliment you both seem very well informed and educated, but how are other people of your age discussing this topic? Or what? Uh, I'm missing the English vocabulary. But do you get what, what he said? Yeah. Yes. So what, what's your perception of what people, how young people are talking about this? I mean, I'm, I'm not that young anymore. I have very very few cousins that are like part of school and when I have discussions with them it very much differs from yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. honestly, okay. like, yeah. so when, when you leave your bubble in, in high well, yeah. back, how is it then? <laughs> I, I think that uh, because Israel is such a high profile uh, country, because we have so much going on every day and you see it in the street, you, you see Arabs, you see Jews, you see um, uh, religious uh, Jews, you see religious, uh, uh, you see Muslims everywhere. Uh, so I think young people are very informed. They, they do know what they're talking about. Um, almost everybody has a TV in their home. The news is, is all day long um, on TV. And I don't think they're ignorant at all. They, um, even when they hear about um, very basic topics, they go and research for themselves. 
And I think the educational system is built in a way that uh, every student also has the basic um, knowledge for everything that can um, be used and um, that you can build a foundation on for the things that are happening right now. Um, in our age, um, that's the age where, where students uh, start to go to the protest. So I know of a lot of, uh, sorry, <laughs> I know of a lot of uh, uh, friends of mine that go to the protests every week and they're very active and uh, especially on social media, a lot of young um, kids are, so, uh, are active and they are very well informed. You can have a, a very serious conversation with um, younger how old are you both? We're both 17. Yes. Wow. <laughs> um, but I would add, so while I agree with what Becky says in the places that we live in, we may have sort of, we, we kind of may live in a bubble. <coughs> Personally, I study in a gifted class, so the people that I uh, interact with on a daily basis, they're, uh, they're also very well informed of these topics. Um, I think while many Israeli children and uh, teenagers do read the news a lot because first of all they feel very connected to their country because they're going to serve in the military in the next few years so you actually have to think about the government in your country and what's happening and not just living your regular life yeah. um but other than that maybe um not having enough knowledge of what's happening in the country also may be leading to the political uh crises <laughs> that we have today with people not being well informed enough or for example but the I risks don't think of these, it starts uh, with uh i don't think it's uh, a children like I don't think children are the problem because uh, schools try to inform them as, as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. I think it's more of like ignorant people that uh, don't want to hear anything, that yeah. are very um, focused on their opinions and um, you can't uh, have a discussion with them, they're not very open. Yeah. Very extreme people. But it's not special for teenagers specifically. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we just stay in Bremen for some more days? Yes, we have till uh, the 4th of July. Yeah, so we're going to talk with uh, more people like you guys and, uh, <laughs> and with yeah. more uh, teenagers in the next coming days. Yeah, we have uh, one school tomorrow morning mm -hmm. that we're going to visit. Yeah. Yes. Anything else? Yeah, I, I do have sure. uh, one last question. Um, I don't know the English name for Wildschweine. Um, ah, and Boers. Boers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say why it yes. <laughs> It's okay. It's a metal, right? Yeah. They're called Boers. It's so strange, this problem with all these little parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So while Israel has many crises, yeah. I think for people in Haifa, that's the main one. And in, uh, in October, we have uh, local elections, and that's the main running topic of the city. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a fun change compared to what everything else that's happening. Where are the positions on the question of wild boars? I mean, so, okay, so the positions are, there's one position that says to exterminate the boars and kill them all. But then scientists say that the moment you start killing them, just, they'll just create uh, more yeah, babies yeah. and there'll be more boars. And then there's been some crazy new ideas of sending um, the boars to a city called Zichon Yaakov, which is around an hour from Haifa and just letting them roam over there. Does anybody live there? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, wow. Actually, uh, there's a group of, of Germans that live there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is it historical revenge then? Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. Um, so really, there's a lot of different opinions on that, but everyone agrees on that we should do something with the boars and just the... Yeah. Um, the decision process is actually uh, uh, there. There's uh, two competing um, candidates for our local um, yeah office. Office, yeah, um, and the the uh, our current mayor, she um, she didn't really know what to do with the boards because it was such a big problem, and uh, that's why people st like stopped liking her. So she was very popular at the beginning because we had a, a pretty elderly uh, man that uh, that was uh, 16 years our mayor and they wanted to change so she was very popular and she did many good things but then the boards started to come and it was so complicated that she well yeah <laughs> now now they're they're debating if they want to go back to the old mayor <laughs> so yeah next year we will have uh, two other students I'm sure yeah. tell us about the wild boar question yes how, how, they, how it got solved hopefully so thank you very much for coming thank you and, uh, thank you for having us <laughs>